Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Rox. I'm a first year master student at USF studying sociology, and I recently graduated this past May with my degree in interdisciplinary social sciences with concentrations in psychology and sociology, just like Dr. Miller. Dr. Miller's intro to sociology class was my very first undergraduate class, and since that class in 2016, he's been both my formal and informal mentor. I worked with him as a research assistant and contributed to two articles. The first one published and the second, uh, my fellow research assistant and I were able to present at a conference and is currently under review. Since graduating, I've been assisting in the development of his book on the Bridge Kids, much of which we will discuss tonight. Dr. Miller provided me with the great opportunity to co-author the conclusion section with his own mentor, Dr. Tillman. Dr. Miller's work is so relevant to the current state of affairs in the United States, as society continues to grapple with race relations and how we move forward together, rather than further divide based on skin color and cultural differences. I've had the unique opportunity to work very closely with him, and I know that the research that he's doing in these areas will help people better understand how society can benefit from embracing our differences and working to close the gap in racial divisions. Introducing Dr. Miller tonight is Dean Eric Eisenberg from the College of Arts and Sciences. 
and it is my great pleasure to welcome him to our conversation. It's been so wonderful to share some of my experiences with you, and I hope that you'll enjoy Dr. Miller's talk this evening. Dean Eisenberg, take it away. Thank you, Sarah, for that wonderful introduction, and good evening, everyone. It is so good to be here with you tonight for our second virtual Trailblazers Talk of the Year. Thank you for choosing to spend your evening with the College of Arts and Sciences. We have a great talk for you tonight, one that I think will make an impact on many of us, given the heightened awareness and attention to issues of race that Sarah just referred to at this pivotal time in American history. Before I introduce Dr. Miller, I want to take a moment to thank our alumni and friends whose generous contributions have enabled the college to host these Trailblazers events for more than 42 years. It is our hope that by connecting our outstanding faculty to the community, we can advance important discussions related to their research that influences our daily lives and has a timely connection to real world events. I also wanna point out that the wonderful music that you heard during the event opening was provided by the USF Jazz Tet Group, the top small group in the internationally acclaimed USF Jazz Studies Program. <clears throat> I would like to also take a minute to highlight one of the newest strategic initiatives at USF, the funding of 23 research projects that will focus on systemic inequality, disparities, and other issues related to race and racism, an effort that began as a response to local and national protests calling for racial equity. These projects include about 90 faculty across eight colleges and all three USF campuses. Covering a range of topics, the college has several faculty members involved in innovative interdisciplinary research that will advance the way the world understands and responds to issues of race and inequality. We're so fortunate as a college to have you all helping us to advance these goals and cheering us on as we work to drive change. Your unwavering support has helped propel us to where we are today and where we will continue to go in the future. Though we are surely in uncertain times, I'm encouraged to see our community embrace new ideas and participate in intellectual conversations that challenge us to think differently and outside of the conventional subjects of discussion and to listen to our faculty experts on what are sometimes called controversial topics. Previous Trailblazers lectures have dealt with subjects such as the role that religion should play in politics and everyday life, philosophy and entrepreneurship, climate change, and other topics that impact our everyday living, just as our topic does tonight. 2020 has presented itself to be a year of unique challenges and also a year of self-reflection from questions about how we best deal with the novel coronavirus to record levels of polarization and political discourse. Very few people are happy with how things are going and many see this as a time to fundamentally change our society. A key element of this change relates to the current state of race relations. Much like civil rights movement of the 1960s, citizens today from all walks of life are coming together to call for reform to systems that have for too long created inequitable conditions for people of color. And of course, these calls have been most prominent from the millennial and Generation Z generations. These groups' willingness to put themselves out there, reach across racial lines, and be in a position to make change at the individual level reinforces and accelerates potential societal and policy change. So during tonight's presentation, our speaker will highlight how now more than ever, young adults are crossing racial lines for friendships and romantic relationships. Many have also grown up in mixed race households and have family members in interracial romantic relationships, creating a different kind of normative experience. Dr. Byron Miller will discuss how these bridge kids are not only connecting family, friends, and racial groups, but they're also changing the very way that we view race and the very structure of race relations. As part of our program tonight, we will be hosting the Q&A program using our chat box. We will open the chat box about halfway through the talk, and Dr. Miller will address your questions and comments after his presentation. So please ask away. Dr. Miller is Associate Professor in Sociology at USF. His research has been published in journals including Social Science Research, Sociological Perspectives, a Journal of Youth and Adolescence, and examines a variety of topics related to adolescent development, dating, mental health, and interracial relationships. He uses an epidemiological approach to investigate how psychological and social factors influence health outcomes and his current research examines interracial romance 
and mental health outcomes among college-aged adults. He recently finished a book manuscript called Interracial Romance and Race Relations, Bridging Generations and Society, which is currently under contract with Lexington Books. Please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Byron Mill. Thank you so much, Dean Eisenberg, and good evening to everyone. It is absolutely my pleasure to be here tonight. And I'm very glad you all decided to spend some of your time this evening with me and the College of Arts and Sciences at one of the best universities in the world, USF. So before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to extend my sincere thanks to the USF Alumni Association, uh, to Dean Eisenberg, Kelly, Terry, and the rest of the amazing College of Arts and Science staff that has helped prepare tonight's event. Uh, Dean Michael for all of her support on the St. Pete campus. Uh, Sarah Green and all of my lovely colleagues in the Department of Sociology and Interdisciplinary Social Sciences. And a special thanks to Sarah Rocks and all of my students, both past, present, and future, for inspiring me to do what I do. Um, so in 1967, during a time when race relations uh, between blacks and whites in America were extremely strained, to say the least, uh, Sidney Poitier and Catherine Houghton, uh, they portrayed a black-white interracial couple in what became an award-winning movie uh, named Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? And essentially what they did was they put the world on notice that interracial relationships were no longer going to be taboo partnerships done in the shadows but rather a part of mainstream society. And so tonight's talk um, is very important because looking back at the timing of that film's release, it was ingenious because earlier that same year, 1967, the Supreme Court uh, ruled that prohibiting interracial romantic relationships was actually illegal. It violated individuals' 14th Amendment rights, and it was decided in the case that was aptly named Loving versus Virginia. And so Richard and Mildred Loving, pictured here, um, it's their love story, along with those of many others, that has greatly inspired my research. And tonight's talk is largely based on the book in my upcoming uh, work titled Interracial Romance and Race Relations, Bridging Generations in Society, as mentioned by Dean Eisenberg. And in this book, I refer to the Lovings and other young adults that engage in interracial relationships as the bridge kids. And I use the idea of these bridge kids to discuss how people in interracial relationships, how they're changing race relations, and how they're doing so by connecting individuals from different racial groups, by connecting family and friends from different racial groups who otherwise probably would never meet or at least be part of the same social network, and even challenging the very idea of race and racial identity itself as multi-racial multi childbirths uh, explode. And so before I go to the next slide, i like to take a second, and I want everyone to close their eyes. I know I can't see you, but just take a second, close your eyes, and picture an interracial couple in your mind. I know some of you are peeking, so stop peeking. Give me some virtual participation. So close your mind and think of an interracial couple. All right, you can open your eyes. And now I would imagine that many of you, if not most of you, probably thought of a black man and a white woman when you think of an interracial relationship. But not many of us think about, well, what about a white man and a biracial woman, or a black man and a biracial woman, or two biracial people. And this is just getting to the point that there are a plethora of possible color combinations that can be defined as interracial couples that go beyond the basics of black and white romance. And for interracial relationships, beyond the couples themselves, what many of us tend to forget about are those other people that affect and are affected by interracial couples, such as the couple's friends. Young adults you know, tend to date interracially when they have racially diverse friendship networks. And more, you know, more diverse their network is, the more likely they are to date interracially. Okay? 
Or how about those children born to interracial couples? Can you imagine that these two young ladies in these middle pictures, they're actually twin sisters with the same parents? Okay, so what kind of conversations do you think people have when these young ladies walk up and tell them that, hey, we're not just friends or, or family members, we're actually twins? And then, moreover, how do you racially define these young ladies? Is one black? Is one white? Is Are they both black? Are they both white? Are they both multiracial? And these are the types of questions that uh, the children from interracial couples tend to generate. And then the picture on the right, uh, depicting a family from a show called Mixed Dish. And, and what more and more people are experiencing are intergenerational social interactions in the context of biracial and multiracial families. Okay? And so by selecting a partner from another racial group, this couple, uh, black white couple in this example. Okay, now their family gatherings is, consists of blacks and whites and multiracials and possibly members of other groups, Asians and Native Americans and Hispanics who all get together and break bread together because this couple was brave enough to venture out and not base their love on social standards of, of color. And of course, there are going to be some families that have haters that disapprove of such racial mixing, and I'll come back to them later. Uh, but the main point of this is that there are all types of racially diverse social environments that racial stereotypes and discrimination exist, and they're likely to be exposed and addressed in multiracial and uh, diverse settings. And part of the reason that race relations are changing in the United States is because more and more people than ever are in interracial relationships. So, for example, in 1967, when interracial relationships and marriages were finally legalized, only about 3% of newlyweds and less than 1% of all married individuals were in interracial relationships. But those numbers have climbed greatly to 17% of newlyweds and 10% of all marriages in 2015, as depicted in the graph. And so look, thinking about the numbers, this translates to be about 600,000 interracially married people in 1970, compared to about 11 million in 2015. Um, I'm not a math professor, but that's a big, 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 big difference. Um, and when you look at less formal relationships, because most of the data tends to be focused on marriages. Okay? But when you look at less formal relationships like dating um, and cohabiting, we see almost the exact numbers. So about 17% of adolescents who are romantically involved, they're also interracially dating. And about 17% of people who are cohabitating, they're also in interracial relationships. So no matter how you slice it, if you're looking at marriages, if you're looking at dating, if you're looking at cohabiting, about one out of three people are in some type of interracial relationship. So if you know more than six people, then that means that one of them is likely to be in an interracial relationship. Okay. And also concurrent with this increase in interracial involvement, we see you know changes in attitudes uh, approving of interracial relationships. So. For example, about 25% of Americans approved of interracial marriage in 1970, but now that number is almost tripled to 63% today. And looking at these trends over time, another consistent temporal trend is that young adults are more likely to approve of interracial relationships and engage in interracial relationships than their older cohorts. Okay, so that means young adults are also more likely to have family and friends that are also in interracial relationships if, if they're not themselves. So being in an interracial relationship inherently exposes a person's family and friends to interact with people from different racial backgrounds. And then it is this way that interracial relationships, particularly among young adults, that's how they're bridging and connecting different racial groups in our society. Okay, so these bridge kids, as I call them, um, they're not only the bridge between racial groups, but they're also a bridge for social changes, to race relations, to family formations, 
and other broader social issues. Okay. And as the bridge kids contribute to changes in race relations, I think that it's imperative for us to step back and consider, well, exactly, well, what is race? And how does race shape an individual's views towards interracial relationships? And so in the 18th, 19th century, uh, scientists like Carl Linnaeus and Samuel Morton, um, they created these taxonomies that divided humans into these hierarchical classifications um, with European whites at the top and Asians and natives in the middle and African blacks at the bottom of their classifications. And it was their idea that race was biological. But, you know, that was the 18th, 19th century. And now with different science, newer science applications and so social scientific analysis, those, those definitions of biological differences and race, they don't hold water anymore. Okay, for one, racial categories on the census continue to change over time. So if race is biological, either government officials are finding people, uh, seeing their genetics and finding new genetic forms of human beings on a regular basis that makes them have to change the census, or it's due to some socio-political uh, climate to make them add or change uh, the racial classifications on the census. Second, if race were biological, why doesn't every society have the exact same racial categories? In fact, most societies have different categories and in the majority go by cultural and ethnic differences. Um, some use colors, but for the most part, they use cultural differences and ethnic differences and not racial differences. And they sure don't have the same categories as we do in here in the United States. Um, a third reason, a piece of uh, evidence is that the Office of Management and Budget that actually sets the racial standards uh, that's used on the census, they acknowledge that those categories are socially defined and not based on biology or genetics. And, and lastly, the scientists and the geneticists working on the Human Genome Project that uh, decoded three billion nucleotides for the human DNA, they found that after decoding the entire DNA strand that there is no gene for race. And so the idea of race um, is it's not biological, but rather it's socially constructed. And so if we understand that the idea of race itself is socially constructed, then we also realize that interracial relationships are based on social differences, not biological differences. So, but still, ideas of race, racial identity, uh, they still have a place in our society. And these things tend to be learned through socialization. And for the most people, that process begins with the family. And racial socialization in the, in the family, uh, home or whoever is the primary guardian of these individual um, young adults. Okay, so in terms of relationship formation, family set the tone for how individuals view race versus their own, as well as compared to others. Do you see yourself at the top of this hierarchy, in the bottom of the hierarchy? Do you look up to, or are you fearful of other groups? Families set the tone for how we view race, again, as well as our own. Okay. Race relations, families set the tone for, well, expectations for interacting with people from the same or other racial groups, some families, they encourage interracial interactions. Some families discourage interracial interactions. Okay? And these things get socially reproduced from generation to generation, these attitudes and behaviors, although some people use their agency to break away from some of those things that they learn uh, through family racial socialization. And then partner selection. Okay? Families say, well, who is and who isn't considered an acceptable partner? Uh, so what role does race play in partner acceptability? Hey, there's a difference uh, as a, let's pretend that I'm a black man for a minute. Okay. And so if someone said, if my parents could say, you know, you better not bring home a white girl, yeah, the odds are that I don't want to disappoint my family, so I might not. 
Okay? But it's a totally different message if my family says, you know what, you love who you love and don't worry about it. And so in those instances, I'm much less likely to worry about race or color or heritage and just more worry about the individual themselves. So family plays a humongous role in setting those tones for partner acceptability, especially when we're referring to crossing racial lines. And the influence of family is very significant for interracial relationships. And that influence, it's bi-directional, it goes two ways. Okay, family can influence if and whom an individual engages with in an interracial relationship. And people in interracial relationships can also influence the beliefs and behaviors of their family. Okay? And this is very important because it's estimated that one out of three people have one intermarried family member. And then that, again, doesn't include all those other types of relationships, the millions of people who are cohabitating and dating interracially. And when it comes to marriage, two out of three people, they're fine with it. Okay? But that approval varies, again, by the race of the partner or the race of the potential partner, because people are much less approving, about 66% percent approve if the potential partner is going to be black versus around 75 percent if they're Hispanic or Asian and then 81 percent so if they're white. So people are much more likely to approve of an interracial marriage if the partner is going to be white and less likely to approve if they're going to be black. So there are some differences there. And then again with age there are also some differences. Okay. Who's most likely to approve? Young, young adults, ages 18 to 29, about 85% approve of a family member interracially getting married compared to about 50% for people who are 65 and over. So what we see is this uh, linear association with age and approval where uh, younger individuals are much more uh, likely to approve of a family member being in an interracial marriage. And then those numbers decline uh, with age. Okay, so uh, millennial is much more likely to approve and be in an interracial relationship, but it's their grandparents who are less likely to approve. And then that's where some of those, uh, those tricky things with family and strain come in. And taken together, it's likely that probably half of Americans have at least one family member that's in one of these types of interracial relationships. Okay, so that's at least one family member for probably half of us that is interacting with someone from a different racial group, which is great for race relations in general for our society. Okay, and many of us have more than one family member that's interracially involved. Okay, and these family members can then serve as role models okay, that are, show that interracial relationships, that they approve of those. Okay, so it could be siblings or grandparents or extended kin or even parents who are in interracial relationships themselves. And in addition to family, friends are another primary agent of social, socialization that affects the partnership selection process. So in particular, young adults, they're likely to, again, date someone who's in their friendship network, and they're gonna date someone that their friends approve of. I know, what a shock that young adults want their friends to like their partner. Okay. And they're also likely to date interracially when they have a racially diverse net network of friends, like I mentioned earlier. However, as shown in this graph, nearly one-third of Americans do not have a close friend from another racial group. And this could be due to family racial socialization, uh, distancing themselves from other individuals, and this is a way to social distance before corona hit. Um, but it also could be due just to a lack of diversity in uh, certain communities. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily mean it's intentional. And then on the flip side, you have about 25% of Americans say they have, they have five or more close friends from another race. So together, this kind of implies that the impact of friendship networks, you know, it could be hit or miss. Do you have a racially diverse friendship network? Then you're more likely to do so. But so many people do not then they're less likely to, which impacts those numbers of interracial romance. Okay. And then also things like the race of a family, of the friend's uh, family, is also important. Uh, 
as a black person, I grew up and I paid close attention to the similarities and the differences between my Hispanic, my, my Asian, my black, my white friends. And I also paid close attention that I had several biracial friends with interracially married parents. And to me, that was a signal that in society, interracial relationships, they were okay. Just because someone was from a different race didn't make, make it an issue. And way, one way that young adults form interracial relationships are things through like activities. So like say football or soccer or basketball or swimming or track or any of those sporting events, for example, you know, those team sports, they tend to be racially diverse at racially diverse schools. And, and this gives individuals an opportunity to develop interracial relationships through friendships, which in turn increases their likelihood to date interracially. And it may also encourage their friends to date interracially because uh, young adults like to have the support of their friends. Okay, and they're more likely to feel comfortable uh, if more of their friends date interracially. And that's often what is uh, found in this, in this research. Okay, it's like being part of the club, like, oh, you're dating interracially, me too. Okay, so now we're really good friends. Okay. And family and friends, they can encourage and support people in interracial relationships, but they can also disapprove um, along with members of the general society. Um, and due to their marginalized status, people in interracial relationships, they're likely to be exposed to a variety of social stressors that adversely affect their health compared to those in same race relationships who don't have to face these stressors because they're not in a marginalized relationship. Okay. And so accordingly, what we find uh, in the research is that people in interracial relationships, they tend to have greater depression relative to those in same race relationships, uh, greater anxiety, they have less support from their family, they have less close relationship with their parents. And so the graph here on the right, it's actually from work with uh, my colleague, Catherine Tillman, and it shows that uh, the white bars are interracially dating adolescents and the black bars are those in same race relationships. And so what you can see is that in general, uh, adolescents who have, who are in interracial relationships, they tend to have greater depression than those in same race relationships. Okay. And the two bars to the left, um, for white, you can see that that's where the greatest disparity is between interracial and same race. Right, so this kind of indicates overall that interracial romance, it doesn't affect the psychological well-being equally across all groups, because some groups, uh, that difference between the same race and interracial uh, depression scores is different. So interracial relationships, they're not impacting everyone the same. So those are some of the things that we need to get at, or why are there differences? It's also important to keep in mind that relationships, they just don't occur in vacuums. Okay? We're social creatures. Relationships don't, don't occur in vacuums. And all interracial relationships include at least one racial minority. And that racial minority is likely to experience things like racism, discrimination, or microaggressions in their daily lives. And that can impact and pro proliferate to impact their other partner. Okay. And then whites who are not used to being exposed to racism and discrimination, they might be exposed to these things because of the relationship they're in. Okay. They might be negatively affected by the racial discrimination experienced by their partner, or they could be in a social setting where they both receive uh, some type of racial discrimination. Uh, and this, this may partially explain why uh, whites in interracial relationships have poor mental health found in the previous slide. But again, it's something else that uh, we need more research on to flush out. Okay. Things like social support, they protect health. Okay. Having people who are supportive and also uh, the types of resources that support gives, uh, that's very important. It worsens social strain, worsens health. Uh, you can have people who disapprove, and those types of social strains um, all 
all uh, cause poor health. Okay, and for example, there is a couple in Washington, in Olympia, Washington, in 2016. It was a black-white couple walking down the street, and a gentleman just walks by and stabbed both the male and the female uh, because he said he was a self-proclaimed uh, white supremacist. And this graph to the right, work by my uh, other colleague, my buddy Ben Kale and I, it shows that when you look at overall health, the race of one's partner, again, matters. And in fact, what we find in general is that minorities who have who are married to white partners tend to have better health than minorities who are in same race relationships. So it seems like maybe there's a level of support that they're getting um, for protective factors in those relationships that, again, we need to flush out a little bit more. And so as we look beyond health and partner selection, and we see the rise of interracial relationships, it's linked to uh, what's called the biracial baby boom. And the biracial baby boom is a really important thing to study because multiracial uh, population is the fastest growing group in the U.S. Whereas in 1970, they consist of about 1% of the population. And in 2015, uh, about 14% of uh, babies were born that were born had multiracial um, identities. Okay? And this multiracial identity is challenging. Well, exactly how are we going to define race and racial categories? And this racial blending implies that you know, persons with blended identity is neither one group or the other group, but rather this new racial group. And again, we need, we need more research on this multiracial uh, population because it's relatively new. People weren't able to self-identify as multiracial until the 2000 census. And then we also need to get more data and research at the social determinants that affect multiracial health. And again, looking at the future, multiracial, how, how, are we, how we look at multiracials, it's helping redefine race in and of itself. Okay, many multiracial people have what's considered to be a racially ambiguous appearance. And since they don't look white, they're often uh, obligatorily placed in the black category due to the one drop rule uh, that has historically done that. And then there are a number of multiracial individuals that do not identify as multiracial. Um, I have a good buddy. His mother is Irish. He is chi his father is Chinese, but he identifies as white and refuses to identify as multiracial or Chinese. And so in the bigger scheme of things, it's actually throwing off the data when someone who's multiracial identifies as only one racial group. Uh, multiracials are changing race relations through their family uh, gatherings. And so now it's much more common for us to be in a grocery store or out shopping and see uh, white grandparents with brown skinned uh, grand grandchildren. And that's become much more normative in our in society today. And now it's holiday time. More people are having gatherings where it's blacks and whites and Asians and multiracial and Hispanics all together. And so it's in these ways that the bridge kids are changing society uh, through through uh, these interactions. And hopefully what we'll see is that these bridge kids will tear down the metaphorical Berlin Wall of racism that's dividing us and it will finally fall in the United States. And so this graph is based off of data uh, from the US Census. And what it shows is that uh, it's looking at counties where pe two people will be of different racial groups. And so what it shows is that in the blue uh, is much less diverse and red is more diverse. And so as you can see, in the southern United States, it's very racially diverse. And the Tampa Bay region is one of the most diverse regions in the country. And so knowing we have such racial diversity in this region makes tonight's topic that much more relevant and important for our community. And therefore, we need to invest more in the research that helps us better understand the partner selection process for young adults and other individuals in interracial relationship and how it's affecting the choices uh, and how these choices are affecting their lives and well-being. And so as we come to the end uh, here, uh, I believe that the evidence suggests we need to recognize that much more research is needed on interracial relationships and these issues affect most Americans either directly or indirectly. 
the impact of interracial relationships and the biracial baby boom will grow as the number of bridge kids grow. And this area of research needs to be connected to our communities nationally and locally. And this is where my research is really unique and important. And funding my research, especially during the summer with the help of uh, great student research assistants, will be very beneficial to our university and our communities. Thank you so much. I appreciate all of your time that you've given me. And now I'll turn things back to Dean Eisenberg to facilitate the question and answer. Thank you, Byron. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We've got lots and lots of questions coming in. So you prepared? Are you ready? I'll do my best. All right, we're going to do this. So um, the first question has to do with geography. So uh, one of the audience members is asking about the health graph that you showed and whether it just was for this region or for the nation. And then is connecting that to the broader international question about how are interracial relations seen around the world. I've read that um, in Eastern Europe in particular, there's still a big taboo against interracial relationships. Have you thought about how this uh, phenomenon that you study varies by geography within and outside of the U.S.? Yeah, that's definitely something that I've looked at, at least within the U.S., particularly um, uh, using the adolescent uh, adolescent uh, longitudinal study to mm -hmm. ha the ad health data set. We looked at that, and it's something that we did not see differences um, regionally. Looking at the South, uh, the West, the East, it was it's a nationally representative data set, and we didn't mm. see that there were any. Uh, regional differences, which uh, we thought were really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I haven't looked uh, at uh, different things globally. Uh, I just pay attention to what's in the news and things like that. I have not researched it, but it seems like um, it's an issue um, definitely in Europe, um, in many of the African nations as well. Um, I'm not sure about the Asian nations. So it seems like worldwide uh, interracial couples uh, Although they're becoming more accepted, it's still an issue. Yeah, and I think I think also when you go internationally, it's not necessarily about skin tone or skin color, right? It can be about ethnicity and heritage and things like that, which sort of, sort of leads to another obvious question that I'm sure you've thought about is, are there parallels between interracial and interfaith relationships, or would it be make sense to think about those as separate phenomena? Definitely. There's parallels, but they're separate. And actually, uh, uh, the Pew Research, they found that people care more about having the same religion as someone than having a different race, ethnicity than someone. So wow. They, yeah, so they'd be more supportive. Like, so family members would be more supportive if you have the same faith as I do versus if you have a, a different... Uh, skin, skin color, or ethnicity. Yeah, so religion is very important to, to most people. Oh, that, yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, here's another question, Byron. Um, the question is: In a time when the country feels more polarized than ever on issues of race, how do you think the Bridge Kids can help change the minds of older generations? That's a really good question, Dean Eisenberg, and I think. The way the bridge kids can reach the older generations, mainly through the multiracial childbirths. Um, <laughs> I, I've looked at it lots of different ways, and I think right. the best analogy is uh, the Bruce Lee uh, bi biography, and he states how he and his in-laws did not get along. They didn't like him because he was Chinese and they were white. Okay. Hey, but once the baby was born, it totally changed the relationships. The mother-in-law loved him, loved the baby. So the, the multiracial children is a way that they tie together. And so, you know, it's like the child, the parents, and the grandparents. And that child ties all those generations together. Yeah, it'd be interesting, right, to think about why that is. Um, there's something about the physical... The reality of the child as biracial or multiracial, right? That sort of uh, sort of 
negates the kind of false beliefs that people might have about another race, right? I mean, it sort of is a living example of maybe why you need to move on with your thinking, you know, so something like that, right? Yeah, it's, hey, that's still my blood, so. Yeah, yeah exactly, awesome. exactly, exactly. Let's see, somebody is asking about uh, if those in interracial relationships tend to have worse mental health outcomes, does it matter what kind of interracial relationships? Have you looked at white black versus white Hispanic versus black Hispanic, or is it just in general interracial relationships tend to struggle? In general, they tend to struggle, but what we what the data tends to show is that whites are struggling more. And I think that gets at the idea of having to deal with a partner who experiences things in society like racism, discrimination that they themselves might not have to deal with. Or um, there could be lots of other factors, like it could be the, the family of their partner or their own family, so that they have to experience the strains or they lose uh, types of support, supportive systems. But uh, again, that's something that uh, we need more research on. And one of the studies that I've done, it shows that uh, the lack of family support, emotional support from family is one of those factors that reduces uh, psychological well-being. Yeah, no, I imagine that that kind of social support would be huge. This is, this is an interesting question. I'm, uh, I think they're making a connection between IRR and racism. They're asking, can you assume that interracial relationships, friendships, and romances are absent of racism and indicators of racial progress or not? Do you know the extent to which racism could still exist in families and relationships like this? That's an interesting question. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I don't know what the research shows, but daily life shows that it absolutely can exist. Right. Um, yeah, families can still say that they disapprove. And actually, some, some of the research shows that, uh, I think in a Bell and Hastings, it shows that, you know, there might be one parent, like mm -hmm. one one parent approves and the other parent disapproves. Sure. And, and then there are instances where the parent who disapproves, you know, tries, gets the other, convinces the other parent, for example, to start disapproving where initially they oh. did. So I don't think that it's necessarily kumbaya just because they're in an interracial relationship. And yeah, I definitely think that there's still, all, there's still issues oftentimes. Got it. Got it. Uh, someone is asking, you mentioned that your friend chose to identify as white rather than multiracial. This is your friend who is uh, part, part Chinese, right? Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that bridge kids will be more likely to embrace their identities as multiracial, or do you think that they're more likely to choose one or another racial identity? That's a pretty good one. Um, <laughs> so, These are good questions. Yeah, I like that. So... Uh, it, so for right now, it's, it's about status. So individuals who are Asian and white, native and white, they're more likely to have be part of that multiracial identity gap because they tend to identify as white instead of multiracial or as Asian or as Native American. Um, and also, I, I'm pretty sure skin tone and other other factors are involved there, but individuals who are black and white, uh, tend to be, tend to identify as black. So I, and, and I think also one of the differences going forward would be, again, uh, we've only had two censuses, uh, well now three with 2020 um, concluding, where individuals are able to identify as multiracial. So I think in the future, as more parents identify as multiracial, mm -hmm. um, you might get more children to start self-identifying as multiracial. Got it. Got it. Uh, this is somewhat related to that. Um, the question is, do you have any data that speaks to the extent to which the racial identities of children in mixed race households are somehow dependent on the closeness of their relationship with the child and each particular parent? In other words, is there a possibility that given the dynamics of the family dynamics that child's, children might ally themselves both racially and also uh, with, with a different parent? interesting thought. I like that. And no, I, I don't have the data. I don't know what data set for it. And that's, 
exactly why we need to get more research in this right. area because uh, because part of it is just asking those research questions that allow you or allow the researcher to uh, discern if someone's multiracial or, or not, and we don't have that often. Have you have you looked in your work, Byron, at um, at families that become multiracial through adoption, where they adopt a child of a different race? Does that track on any of the other things that you're finding, or are you mostly looking at romantic partnerships? I'm mostly looking at romantic partnerships, but uh, my colleague Rudy Roy, uh, she wrote a book that addresses this, and um, I wrote the review for the book earlier uh, this year. And mm -hmm. the, the multiracial adoptions is the biracial adoptions is interesting because yeah, that can go lots of different ways. Right. It, um, yeah, it, it it could be two let's say two black people who adopt a, a white child. Um, it could be, you know, a multiracial couple who adopts a multiracial child. So yeah, that, that'd be really good to get at. Yeah. I, th I think it's, uh, I think it's interesting because then you get the whole interface, like you were talking about when you first showed that picture of those twins, right? Mm -hmm. That suddenly you have the public interface where people are thinking, well, does that child go with those parents and, you know, and, and all those kind of challenges that, that people have. Yeah. I, and ideally Dean Eisenberg, like that's exactly the type of research that, you know, I think we need is that longitudinal that connects the parents and the children. So you could get at the experiences of both. Well, it, it's complicated, right? Because, you know, very often the place where the, the, the time in a child's life where they are dealing with identity issues anyway, they might be gender identity, racial identity, you know, all kinds of, of identity issues. That's often when an adopted child will often ask those kinds of questions too. So there's something about identity that gets worked out there um, that, yeah, I agree with you. I think more research would be great. So Byron, a lot of people are are wanting to ask this one question, okay. um, which is, um, I was trying to group them all together, but um, one person said, how have interracial relations impacted you personally? But another person said, how did you de decide to pick this topic? What drew you to it? So I'm just wondering, is this, you know, how does, why does this interest you? Well, again, just growing up, uh, I just didn't understand racism, to be honest with you, you know, mm -hmm. and, and then you would see, you'd see couples that are different races. And I'm like, well, you know, as a black kid, you call me the N word, or I'm experiencing different things. It seems like race was important for me, but for some other people it wasn't. And then in our family, uh, my dad had a really close friend who's white. My mom had one who was Hispanic. So, uh, yeah. And then, uh, then I have a niece who's uh, biracial. Uh, and then when I got older, I got into an interracial relationship, but that was after I was doing my research. So it's not like I was, I'm all about interracial relationships. And so, I'm, you know, this is what I study and that's what I got into like now. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Well, this is interesting. So somebody, uh, I was wondering if somebody was going to ask you uh, ask about this. So we know that a lot of relationships these days are being formed through online dating. And with the pandemic, there's maybe even more of that kind of going on. Have you seen any research or have you thought at all about whether online introductions and online dating will exacerbate this issue, make it more likely? Um, because it's it's a weird situation, right? Because you were talking about people meeting relationships through friends and networks, and now we've got these online networks. What do you think about that? Yeah, and so what I've read about the online, and not necessarily during COVID, but people who engage in interracial relationships that they form from online tend to go online to find an interracial relationship. It's uh -huh. not like they go online just looking for love and it just so happens to be interracial. Oftentimes, or more times than not, they're specifically looking to engage in an interracial relationship online. Okay, interesting, interesting. Uh, one of the audience is asking, have you noticed a difference over the years, the last few years, um, in how easy it is to talk about this in your classroom when you think about your students and how your students have been changing is this topic becoming easier to talk about is are the conversations different now than they were in the past 
Uh, that's that's really good, especially because I don't talk much about interracial romance in my classes. Oh, except, you don't. Okay. Um, you know, an in intro to social when we're talking about family or fam social families, I speak about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, I'm comfortable talking about race and um, and any any class, any of the topics. So now okay. I wouldn't say it's necessarily easier. I would say that uh, students are many students, not all, but many students are more interested in these types of, of issues mm -hmm. and topics. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, let me ask you an academic nerdy question. I always reserve the right to ask one nerdy question. Um, so I, I've studied communication networks and social networks. And one of the things that when you do a social network analysis of a, of a society or a group is you identify these network roles. And one of them is the bridge role, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've seen advised is that if somebody is in a bridging role, you can get a group of bridging people together and make them aware of the role that they're in so that they might be better able to play that role. So this is a long way of me asking you, are there support networks for these bridge kids? And are there ways that the bridge kids can become aware of the positive impact that they might have? Or do we just have to sort of hope that this plays out in a positive way? That's really good. I think we need to put those networks out there because I know that there's you know, some people do intentionally do those types of things because, like, I've interviewed uh, individuals and they said, like, hey, I moved to this specific neighborhood because there are other interracial couples in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, students have said that, uh, I, like I mentioned earlier, hey, well, they, they're in an interracial relationship. And then when they talk to their friends who are in interracial relationships, they think they're, they're in a special club together. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't know if they know the impact they, that they can possibly make, but I think that they're definitely um, cognizant of that it's, it's something a little bit different. And again, with the right. families, it's just like, hey, I want to make sure that my family is in a certain type of environment. And they're very cognizant of that as well. Right. No, that, make, that makes sense. Here's somebody that I think wants to volunteer for a research project. Uh, someone says, is Dr. Miller interested in doing long-term studies of interracial couples? That would be, I think, very interesting, right, to do an overtime study and to see how conditions change and how things get worked out, right? Oh, absolutely. It kind of goes with uh, what I mentioned to you earlier about uh, looking at generational differences in couples. So it'd be, it'd be nice to like if you can look at long term, see how someone's say mm -hmm. if they're 21 yeah. now and then if I could follow them if I'm living for another 10, 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then pick up some others along the way to see those differences. That yeah, that'd be that would be fabulous. Yeah, yeah there is um, there's those documentaries, uh, 21 up, 26 up. The one the ones that every 10 or 15 years they did they study they follow the same people. Um, and look at the way in which their decisions play out. So here's somebody who's got, here's somebody who was looking at your map and said, well, wait a minute, how can it be that we have so much more diversity in the South, but, but there ten, the South tends to be considered more racist? Is that a misconception or are we seeing a transformation in the South or are issues of racism and interracial relations like separate issues? Oh, I, I think that, Oh, that's a really good question. But I think that what if you if you look at uh, let's say you know we just had an election. If you look at a political map, and mm -hmm. if you look at a uh, you know if you look at the last five ten national elections, you'll see that those electoral votes they've been changing. Like the states that you know like New York. When when did New York uh, have start to have fewer electoral votes than Florida? You know, it's those types of things that you have those people moving from all across the country for various reasons to the South. And so, um, yeah, so, we, you know, it's just migration. And, mm -hmm. I th and I think that with that, you know, when you get different populations, more diverse populations, people who come with different attitudes, then you're going to get differences in yeah. attitudes towards race, attitudes towards race relations. So maybe that it's, Maybe now it's a misnomer that the South is so racist. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's more racist, uh, you know, up north or other places. Yeah, that, that, what a great answer. I mean, I think it is a, 
It's exactly what you're describing. And, and I think looking at what happened in Atlanta and what's happening in Georgia and the nature of that state, I think even more so than Florida, you can really see you know, some of those migratory and kind of kind of changes. So uh, somebody is looking to see if you want an, any more research assistance. I'm going to say that they should contact you. What's your, what's your email, Byron? Uh, B-A-M-I-L-L-E-3 at usf.edu. Okay. And they can also find you on the website. So. <laughs> absolutely. And if you're, if you're a student at USF, uh, absolutely. If you're not a student at USF, I don't, I don't know. Let's see. So uh, one last question. Yes, sir. Um, so I've been watching, I watch a lot of television. It's part of my job. And one of the things I've noticed in the last few months is that just about every commercial that comes on that has a family in it, it's a multiracial family. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that? And do you think that the media representation is helpful? Are you critical of it? What do you think? Oh, I think it's definitely helpful. Uh, and I think that part of it is I think in 2013, there was a Cheerios commercial where there was a, a <laughs> white woman and there's a multiracial kid and the black guy. And there was so much blowback about that commercial. Right, uh, right. I think that some of the media outlets are just like, you know what, you know, we're, we're going to put this stuff out there anyway. And, you know, mm -hmm. people are recognizing that, that the diversity of America is changing. You know, the demographics are changing. And to reach those diverse groups, be it through you know, capitalist reasons or social reasons, you know, they're they're depicting those groups, which I think is is awesome because it makes people, you know, in those groups, you know, the interracial couple or the multiracial child, you know, like, oh, okay, I see someone on TV like me, it's accepted. It's not exactly. so bad. Exactly. Well, Byron, it has been just a delight to talk with you. I appreciate you spending this time. You're obviously an amazing teacher and an amazing researcher. And I think you can tell from all these questions that the audience has been very engaged. I know we, we had hundreds of people who are listening right now. But anyway, thank you for this. Thanks for spending the evening with us. And I know we're all curious to see what this next generation of Bridge Kids will do as they work to embrace the benefits of, of differences and use their life experiences to propel us uh, forward. So thank you so much, Byron. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dean Eisenberg. Have a good evening. You betcha. And thank everyone I, out there. Absolutely. Well, I hope you all enjoyed tonight's talk as well. Um, before we go for the evening, I want to make a couple of quick announcements. The first is that we will be hosting pediatrician, professor, and public health advocate, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, on Wednesday, March 24th at 7. We're going to do this virtually as part of Frontier Forum. Dr. Atish Hannah Atisha will deliver a personal account of her research to expose and mitigate the effects of the Flint water crisis. This is the second Trailblazers event of the semester, and as we continue to put these together, we hope we can count on you for your continued support of the Frontiers of Knowledge program. We know that it's been hard to get to the university these days, but we're committed to continue to bring these great lectures to you virtually. If you'd like to learn more about the lecture series or about Dr. Miller's work or how to support his work or to be a graduate assistant, uh, please I'll leave a comment in the chat box and a member of our team will be in touch with you uh, to talk about it. Thank you all so very much for attending. Please have a safe and healthy holiday and we hope to see you at our next event in 2021. Stay safe and go Bulls. <laughs>